just as you want to prepare for a disaster or some other occurrence, not anticipating that it actually might strike you, come close to you. The same is true with privacy. So many people have told me they had no real interest in the subject until things in their lives changed and they suddenly valued the importance of keeping personal data, family data confidential. We can't anticipate changes in our lives that are going to make the fact that we gave up so much personal information years prior very important. And so I think we should err on the side of caution. When in doubt, don't give it up. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today our special guest is Robert Ellis Smith, the founder and editor of the most well-established journal on privacy in America, The Privacy Journal. Founded in 1974, and Robert's background is both in law and now a journalist. Robert, thank you for joining our show. Good to join you. I was hoping tonight that we could talk about three main points, one being where have we come from with privacy and its connection with personal liberty in our country? What was citizens of America entitled to, accustomed to? What was the traditional expectation of people's personal privacy? And how is that connected with freedom and liberty? And the second topic, what is changing now? What's the most recent direction and trend that we're on in terms of people's ability to maintain and protect their family's privacy and their liberty? And lastly, what can we do about it? Well, the overriding theme about privacy in the United States is that it's been a reaction to new technology. Privacy wasn't very strongly developed in American law before the 1900s. But in the last part of the prior century, you had uh, new technology, namely a telephone. You had not only a camera technology, but a small camera that could be held in one's hand and could snap a person's picture without consent. You had the ability to overhear telef uh, telephone calls. Um, and uh, you had a high-speed press that allowed for publishing of private information. Even the bicycle was an invasion of privacy and that it allowed for delivery of afternoon newspapers to a huge selection of people introducing ma the mass media for the first time. And uh, that resulted in some court cases and, and uh, statutes that recognized the right to privacy, generally uh, preventing unauthorized images and conversations from being seized from you, and secondly, uh, preventing commercial use of your face or your likeness or facts about you. The second big buildup, I would say, came with the introduction of uh, large centralized computers in the eight, 1980s. Federal government uh, couldn't wait to purchase computers, and every agency had one. And the big concern then was uh, what these large databases held and what they could tell about us and how they would be used. and uh, would they categorize us and would they make us uh, a more impersonal nation? And one factor about that was the introduction of a number to keep track of everybody in these computers, and that was a social security number. Well, then in the first part of this century, uh, we had some new uh, technological challenges, namely uh, a medium that allowed for uh, rather casual uh, correspondence among everybody and the ability to overhear it, uh, namely email. And the fact that it had the name mail in it led people to believe that it was a confidential medium, but it never was. And then came the Internet, and at about the same time came uh, the personal computers. Uh, after being in this business for many years, I didn't anticipate that uh, computing power would be in the hands of individuals. That was a good thing for privacy. It, it taught us all about, uh, about computers, how they operate, what their vulnerabilities are. And it allowed us to share that computer power with large organizations. Uh, but it also meant that more information was stored on us about online that uh, the casualness of the internet led many people to think that it was a trustworthy place to post your personal information. And that's about where we stand now after these three interest, uh, new interests in privacy generated by uh, new technology. So back in the early part of our the first half of our country's uh, history, the standard expectation of most citizens would have been that their their business, their affairs, was largely private, unless they made specific efforts to certain parts of their life were public, but that was very limited. Yeah, well, that's from a legal standpoint, but from a physical standpoint, geographical standpoint, there really wasn't that much concern about privacy because 
it was enough real estate for everybody. You could get all the physical privacy you wanted by just moving a few steps from your home. As we moved into cities, uh, you know, we started to live close together, and that uh, created a need for at least physical privacy. And then, as I say, during the uh, 20th century, we had means for gathering all sorts of information that not only allowed for keeping tabs on people who got government benefits, but also allowed for uh, being much more precise in how we market to them and allowing for generating what was then uh, U.S. mail advertising content. And as time went on, that became very wasteful unless you could target in on people who were uh, prime part prospects. And the way you do that is to keep all sorts of personal information on them and to massage the, uh, the lists uh, automatically. So that has been the trend, I guess. Uh, a continual fight, uh, I think it's very closely connected to consumer commercialism in, 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 a, in the American economy. Uh, the more we get involved in wanting to buy all sorts of products and services, I think the more we sacrifice our privacy by putting in the hands of a lot of, a lot of organizations uh, personal information about ourselves. And isn't it true that there's a very enticing uh, attractiveness to the convenient factors? The more, uh, for example, we've we've traveled routinely across the country because we our family members are dispersed, and up until now we always had to stop at the toll booths and and put on our own coins and drive on our way. We finally. After years and years, what we felt broke down and got one of those transponders you stick on your windshield, and you can just drive right through the tow booths at full speed, and it's half the half the fare. So we save money, we save time, and we're immediately trackable. So, and uh, we were also shocked that recently we were on vacation at a resort. We felt like we were really getting away from it all in the middle of nowhere, and looked at my map on my eye on my cell phone and saw a little dot where we were and as we walked it showed which room we were at in the in the hotel and as we walked from there to the out on the patio it showed we were moving along and realized oh my gosh these conveniences can be so enticing but you sometimes unknowingly give up significant amounts of your privacy just by going along with the convenience factor yeah true i've yielded with regard to the automated toll systems they're uh cost effective and and they're much more convenient um first i wanted to s- wait till a dust settled and, and to explore the technology and make sure that it was as secure as possible. But uh, it's not very private. Um, the uh, lists of where you've been and your travel times are right there for you to see, not for everybody to see, but certainly for law enforcement to see, not only after the fact if they have the proper paperwork, but now in real time. Many of these conveniences keep track of our location in real time, and I'm anticipating uh, – your next category of questions, which is what's new. And what's new is that uh, the concern about our information in huge data banks seems to have been replaced by a concern, at least in my mind, by by systems that keep track of where you are. Uh, That now, I think, is much more important than uh, uh, your credit card information, how you spend your money and the like. And it sheds light on what NSA has been doing because they seem to be more interested in the uh, calling patterns of people than in the actual content of the conversations. Many, many conversations don't have much uh, depth to them anyway. But who you uh, call and who calls you are very important in establishing uh, patterns and uh, uh, showing who your associates are. Um, And that's really what uh, the NSA wants. They call it megadata, but all it is is a running category, a running list of all the calls dialed from your phone and all the calls dialed to it. Um, And it shows that, uh, and by the way, cell calling records also indicate the nearest cell tower that you used, uh, maybe more than one in a conversation, too. So it's the location of where you are that seems to interest uh, not only the marketers but the government, uh, more so now than the uh, content of data about you. And that's one of the things that was predicted in decades gone by from some of the writers of old who wrote about the, the future about how the people's whereabouts to be tracked with implanted microchips or that sort of thing, and, and people poo-poo that a lot. But the the fact that we're now voluntarily uh, carrying cell phones around with us, or people have said that there are uh, now stores that are tracking your, your whereabouts as you move about throughout the store so that they can have automatic uh, offers displayed or that sort of thing, depending on what your interests are. Or in the virtual world, uh, where you go, if you search for something 
on the internet search, you'll suddenly find that other sites you visit that you've never even been to before are displaying ads that are right along the line of what you were just searching about the day before. So it's it's your virtual where, where you go, not just your physical where you go. It's, it starts to track your intentions and your thoughts and your behavior patterns as well. Yeah. In fact, this tracking of people's whereabouts is more in keeping with uh, the horror of George Orwell's 1984, more so than the keeping of computerized data records. In fact, uh, Orwell anticipated paper records 20 years after he wrote that book, not not automated digital record keeping. But consider uh, ATM machines, uh, cell towers, um, automated uh, toll systems, uh, street view, uh, many, many other technologies. Their main value to the government and to the commercial sector is that they keep track of where you are, not necessarily who you are. And in that, uh, they tell an awful lot about your commercial predilections, but also who your friends are, who your pals are. That now can be detected from uh, calling records and, and cell records. So some of the people who are interested in our Reluctant Preppers website here and who listen to our channels, our subscribers, are people who are very concerned about protecting their families, protecting the things they can't afford to lose. And for a number of them, privacy is a key importance and a key value. Uh, we've had some of our other guests on here when talking about making preparedness plans as a family, whether you're storing food or water or precious metals or other uh, survival supplies, that sort of thing, that there's a great value in the privacy aspect of it because that's your own personal business and it's no one else's. What suggestions do you have to people who want to do what they can do to carry about their affairs without necess unnecessarily losing the sense of privacy about their own affairs. First thing to do is to recognize that it is an important value, even if so far in your life it hasn't uh, seemed to be very apparent. But just as you want to prepare for a disaster or some other occurrence, not anticipating that it actually might strike you, come close to you, the same is true with privacy. So many people have told me that they had no real interest in the subject until things in their lives changed and they suddenly valued the importance of keeping personal data, family data confidential. Uh, many people say, you know, they had a chronically ill child and that suddenly woke them up to the need for privacy protection or they had a heart condition and realized that that could cost them their job or cost them a promotion. Uh, we can't anticipate changes in our lives that are going to make the fact that we gave up so much personal information years prior very important. And so I think we should err on the side of caution. When in doubt, don't give it up. You can't anticipate when you might wish that you had uh, not given it up. So I advise people uh, to um, think in twos. It's always good to have two telephones, uh, one that you may use for personal sensitive uh, communications and the other for uh, commercial uh, uses, like when you apply for credit in the marketplace or have to give a vendor or a craftsperson uh, your phone number. Two mailing addresses for the same reason, I think. Two bank accounts for the same reason. I think it's good to have a second doctor. And if there's sensitive medical conditions you want treated, maybe have a doctor out of town that would provide some sort of a buffer. It wouldn't, even if there is a respect for confidentiality in the profession, there are still gossips in any medical office. And uh, you might be reassured by having certain sensitive medical treatments uh, out of town. I, I think you need two addresses so that you don't give out your physical address quite so freely when you apply for credit or uh, even when you apply for work. Why not use a post office box or a landlord's address or a friend's address? One of the suggestions in, in a recent article that you wrote in your most recent uh, edition of the Privacy Journal, the article was entitled A Guide for the Frugal Privacy Seeker, and your very first suggestion is one that might just humble a lot of people in terms of how in the world could they achieve it. You said, protect your social security number at all times. Don't give it out, even though it seems you may be penalized for it. Can you give some examples of where it's not necessary, although people might believe that it is, to give out their social security number? It's up in my life all the time. Uh, just today, I was at a walk-in medical clinic and was asked for, and this, this is my pet peeve, they, they say social. May I, I, give me your social. I said, I don't give it out. Well, the clerk merely moved on to the next item and uh, forgot about it. Uh, insurance companies always want it. Uh, there's no law that protects you either way, but I say turn it down. And uh, certainly if you're applying for insurance and they want your social security number, uh, shop elsewhere. 
Uh, banks continue to want it to presume to check that you are actually who you say you are on the telephone. There are other ways to do that, including your date of birth, which is not as descriptive as compromising as your social security number. So you may get turned down for the benefit first time, second time, but these organizations do cave in. Uh, I suggest, uh, as I think I said in the article, whenever you have to deal with any of these organizations, uh, be prepared to just say no and well to walk elsewhere to go across the street to, to shop. Uh, I always try to have the body language, to have the tone of voice that says, I really don't need the, this benefit. So if you're not going to go along with me on not demanding my social security number, then I'm not going to do business with you. I know I shoot myself in the foot sometimes when I do that, but uh, maybe that's the price you pay. I, I even refused for many years to provide a uh, social security number for my children uh, on the tax form. And uh, it turned out that I, I didn't, first of all, I didn't have to do it for many, many years. After the IRS started to get onto me, I just did without the exemption at that point and found other ways to cover for that exemption. So you got to care about it and you got to, you got to poke these bureaucracies in the tummy and see where the give is. You're right. That's another example of trading off privacy for convenience. In the case of applying for a loan or something, you had to walk maybe to a different place to get service, or even a clinic it might happen that way if you needed care. But there's a question of being willing to sacrifice that convenience for saying, I'm, I'm not going to surrender my privacy just for the sake of mere convenience. Uh, yeah, that's the main thing that people have to realize. But secondly, maybe realize, you know, they need us as much as we need them, and they don't want to send a customer away. So People should not be reluctant. Uh, I think even uh, if, if they don't want to give up a certain amount of private information, including a social, social security number, uh, just conclude the negotiations at that point, even if you really, really, really want the transaction, and uh, come back the next day and cave in if you have to cave in. But at least spread the word around the company that this one consumer does care about that. We've, we're seeing a change in attitude now as people realize the uh, consequences of theft of identity. Uh, when, when customers say, they don't want to give up their social security number. Uh, more and more organizations are, are caving in on that one. And sometimes it goes beyond convenience. Uh, you mentioned also in your article about thinking of the safety of your children when you're requested to give out home address. Some people, especially now with social networks on a computer, very casually give out all kinds of personal information uh, in the sense of thinking that it's all just one big happy family out there. But what are some examples of, of ways that you think that people can help to safeguard their, their family's privacy in that area? Well, use some common sense. To say on Facebook, uh, I'm going away for on a four-day vacation, does not make any sense at all. Why would people do that? That's like standing on your front steps and proclaiming that you're going to be away. Uh, you, you've got to be cagey about things like that. And even on social media, there's no need to give out your uh, uh, home address. Uh, use some alternative. And then uh, you, if, if you meet somebody that you want to meet, uh, later on in person and make arrangements uh, not on the social media to give up your your home address when you have photographs put up on uh, uh, social media not only make sure you're sober but make sure there's no identifying artifacts in the background that people can identify your home or your your location uh, don't wear t-shirts that might indicate who you are this is all serious stuff really uh, if you your life as I say does change and you wish that you had taken these precautions and they're, they're not very troublesome either. They're just simple uh, common sense. Uh, but time after time, people, first of all, many people come to me and complain about some organization asking for information about them, and then they'll spill it all out to me, not knowing me at all. Right. And uh, you also mentioned in your article the idea of changing the patterns of your behavior, because as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's really patterns of whether it's consumer behavior or communication behavior or association behavior. And in fact, that's one of the really brought concern to my mind and I think to a lot of our viewers when you mentioned about people tracking who you're associated with because one of the principles uh, that some of our guests have mentioned is uh, having real assets, real skills, and real friends in the sense of you've got to have a network of people who you know and trust if times get tough who you can have a resilient community that can help each other and support each other. So if people want to do not only to protect themselves, but to also help to provide, protect some of the privacy of their friends and associates that they that they have networked with, what are some ways, you mentioned as far as not leaving uh, routine patterns, but, but changing it up? 
Well, one example might be with automated toll systems, take a different route sometimes just to alter those patterns. Uh, don't always use the same uh, ATM uh, if, if you want to disrupt anybody who might be uh, interested in, in what your patterns are. If you have two bank accounts at uh, certain times, you might want to pay some sensitive bills from one account and not the other, just so that it makes it more difficult for those that want to track sensitive information about you, it makes it more difficult for them to actually find it. But that's true also of your physical motions. This isn't uh, confined to privacy, and it's not confined to the electronic age. But uh, if you take a certain walkway to shop or to go to work or whatever, vary it every so often. Uh, and uh, I think that will enhance your security, if not your sense of security. Now, you also mentioned mental rehearsal. Uh, before you enter a situation where you're going to try to maintain your sense of privacy or some of your more personal information, it's very challenging in the spur of the moment because you, there's a natural tendency for people to want to go with the flow, to fit in, to not uh, disrupt the, the, the natural progression of things. I vividly recall a advertisement of about th four years ago on the television where there was a big scene with all these uh, people uh, moving in this very stylized scene, a very complex bunch of activity, everybody doing purchasing behaviors, everybody walking through the lines, picking out their things and sweeping their electronic card, sweeping their electronic card. Everything was moving like clockwork. And finally, one person showed up at the cashier and started fumbling around for change and, and everybody stopped. The entire scene froze and everybody stared at that person to give them the, the green group shame uh, for having disrupted the smooth flow of this well-oiled machine of everybody playing their part. And so just to say that that that's plays on the human emotion of wanting to fit in, and, and it's natural when you're in a situation, if, if the salesperson or whoever it is expects you, the system expects you, the form expects you, there's a blank right there, you want to move quickly, you want to get through this, there's a very natural temptation to just go along with the flow and yield your information, and pretty soon it just becomes so habitual you don't even re resist anymore. So you mentioned in your article the idea of practicing ahead of time and finding ways you can say something that doesn't sound combative but but still maintains your intention. Can you give an example of that that would be real specific that you've used? Yeah, and not being combative I think is very important to this equation, but take the demand, the request for uh, your zip code when you uh, go through the checkout line. Well, it used to be I would tell people that that's pretty innocuous, but I suggest you just say no, so you'll get in the practice of turning down requests for personal information and getting the word back to the management that at least a few consumers don't like to give up that information. Well, it turns out with zip code and credit card numbers, uh, stores can uh, find out all sorts of demographic information about you. It's called reverse appending, and uh, um, the credit card companies for a fee will do that for retailers. Uh, if they provide the credit card numbers and the zip codes of, of their customers. So um, even if you thought it was just innocuous to do it, uh, just say no so you get into the practice of it. Another example was the last four digits of a social security number. Uh, back about 15 years ago, we thought that was what we call pretty good privacy, that that was enough protection and that was not a bad fallback position. But I don't believe that anymore now, especially in the era of uh, the Internet, where with the last four digits and maybe your last name, maybe your hometown, it's not that hard on the Internet to find out the whole Social Security number or, secondly, make an educated guess at it. So don't fall for that uh, fallback position on the part of companies to ask for the last four digits. Now, that just happened to me yesterday, and the tone of the clerk was that uh, I was a little bit paranoid. I shouldn't worry about the last four digits. Well. My experience now is that it's not good to give up those four anyway. I believe that number should not be used in the commercial context at all. It ought to be banned from that. I hope that that happens at some point. It is the root of all uh, identity theft because when you give your social security number, when you apply for credit, the retailer will ask the credit bureau for a credit report and send over your social security number. And the credit bureaus, operating as they do in the 19th century, will send over a credit report uh, that matches the social security number of the one they were given. It doesn't matter whether the addresses and the names and date of birth match or not. Well, we, we know now that the social security number is an instrumentality of fraud and that uh, the credit bureaus have millions and millions of records with somebody else's social security numbers in, in, in their files. And so um, if you don't give up your social security number, you really force the credit bureaus to do a search and a match 
based on other factors like your date of birth and your address and your place of employment, and you'll find that'll cut down your vulnerability to identity theft. Now, you also mentioned in your article the importance of making sure that what information is on file about you is actually true. Is that another way that, that at least you can help your privacy from not being trespassed or besmirched by someone else's information. Yes, uh, it's in everybody's interest to make sure that the information is accurate, whether it's the consumer or the or the company. And so much of this information is not. My estimates are 30 percent of credit reports are erroneous. So it's important to check your credit report regularly with the big three credit um, bureaus nationwide and make sure that it's got in accurate information in it. Uh, I'll give a free subscription to anybody who comes back and says that uh, his or her credit report was accurate in every way. I'll bet it won't be. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I, I, I I, my last name is Smith. I recall sitting there uh, half naked on a, uh, an examining table looking through my medical file. That's, that's your right, by the way, by federal law. A lot of people fought to make that happen, so I hope people will fight to uh, implement it. But I, I asked to see my medical file, went through it, and there were three records, three pieces of paper in there uh, uh, that concerned another person by the name of Smith. Uh, so it happens, and any doctor's office will tell you, of course, their records are perfectly accurate, but they're not. So whenever you have a chance, uh, inspect information about yourself and make sure that it is accurate. You have a right by law to do that with regard to credit reports, school records, medical records, in some states, you have that right with state records, and you have that right with regard to federal agencies. Even where you don't have that right by law, I think it's an important thing to try. Uh, ask to see uh, your files and check out what's in your file. It'll help you cope with that organization a lot better, but also if you find inaccurate stuff, you, that's your chance to get it corrected. Now, a lot of our listeners, as with most of us, have already divulged far more than you've described in terms of our personal information. And is there anything people can do to reclaim some of that privacy to help reduce their footprint out there from what's already been done uh, in addition to making some of these precautions going forward? Well, maybe change companies. Uh, that's one way you change your insurance company, although I can well imagine people might have other motives for wanting to do that, including cost as opposed to privacy. But that's, that's one possibility. Um, another is if you find out they have information about you, write a letter to them and, and, and say that you don't authorize that it be released except in the following circumstances and see if you can uh, get them to abide by what is really a unilateral contract. Sometimes that will work. You can attach conditions to information too, henceforth when, when you're asked to fill out a form. Just put somewhere along that form, you know, that this expires in two years or um, this information may, may be released only to the following entities or this information will be checked with me in two years to see if it's accurate. You can attach conditions to the information that you give up and uh, that's uh, another possibility for doing it too. I don't recommend that people lie on forms. I, I think it might come back to haunt them later. If you lie on an insurance application form or a claims form, your claim when you really need it might well be denied. So I don't recommend doing that. And, and when you lie on forms, you also lose an opportunity to educate that organization that people care about privacy. So what is your favorite uh, way of handling a situation non-combatively when you want to decline giving information? Because just a flat-out no might, might come off as seeming uh, affrontive to people. Yeah, well, I, I initiate a conversation, as I did today, about identity theft. And presume the a clerk is aware of that and may well have personal experience with it or is aware of, and quite often they'll tell me, oh, yeah, we've talked about that in our staff meetings, and we know there is concern about that. So that's one way. I try to get the clerk to relate to me as another human being, worried about uh, being vulnerable, trying to point out some of the dangers, uh, as I did yesterday, trying to talk to a bank clerk uh, about uh, the, the fact that the last four digits of a Social Security number were no great uh, protection. I think you can also get people on the level of parents uh, by whenever you turn down giving up information about kids, um, I, I think that's a way to make a connection, to, to tell them that you're concerned about the identity of your kids being known or that their illnesses might be known to others or, more important, that their home addresses might be known to others and show uh, the possible consequences of that. That's another way uh, to, to, to get at it. I, I try to avoid a generalized conversation where people might tell you, oh, yeah, we heard about a data breach uh, 
last week or something like that. I try to talk in specifics and point out that, uh, in fact, there was a huge breach at Target stores before Christmas. And uh, they've heard of it. And sometimes it, it, uh, a light goes off and they realize uh, why I'm concerned about it. Right. And uh, if people want to find out more of your work and to get plugged in so that they can get updates on more of the uh, information that you put out, Robert, where can they find you on the web? Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. We're at privacyjournal.net. Uh, Privacy Journal is a monthly newsletter. It's available electronically and uh, in hard copy. I've published it for 40 years, if you can believe, long before the Internet and uh, email and the NSA and wiretapping and, and cell phones. Um, the issues have always changed over the years. I, I guess that's one reason I haven't gotten burned out. But I try to give people advice like this and tell them what new laws and what uh, new court cases are on the books that might be of help to them. It's also of interest to professionals in the field. I'll be happy to send a sample copy to people. Uh, one feature I have there is a qu question and answer uh, uh, column. I also do that on my website, too. So if they go to the website, they'll find our email address and send us an email and ask for a sample copy of the newsletter. It's privacyjournal.net, and the uh, email address is uh, orders at privacyjournal.net. Thank you, Robert, so much for taking the time to be with us. We've been speaking with Robert Ellis Smith, the founder and editor of Privacy Journal, an independent monthly on the privacy in the computer age and the oldest journal on privacy in America. Robert, we'll have to have you back another time. Any viewers who have questions that they'd like for Robert to field, please feel free to add them as comments under this video, and we'll see what we can do to get those answered for you. We certainly appreciate you spending the time with us, Robert. Well, thank you, and, and good luck with your website. I think it's a great idea. It's long overdue, and I hope it empowers people. Well, thank you. That's what we're here for, to keep people aware and prepared and appreciate your help in doing that. Thank you. Take care.